Conley and Conley Law Firm, and the University of Tennessee at Martin. Discovery Park of America is a museum and heritage park located in Union City, Tennessee. <clears throat> Our mission is to inspire children and adults to see beyond. We hope everyone who visits us here leaves having been inspired by something they experienced. Beginning this Friday, August 14th, Discovery Park of America will have something really special. We're going to have three pop-up exhibits on women's suffrage. To make our voices heard, Tennessee's women's fight for the vote. Let me start over. To make our voices heard, Tennessee women's fight for the vote from the Tennessee State Library and Archives and the Tennessee State Museum is the first one. The second one is Votes for Women, a Portrait of Persistence, an exhibit of suffrage posters from the Smithsonian Institution, and rightfully hers, a pop-up display from the National Archives in partnership with the Women's Suffrage Centennial Commission. It contains images of documents, artifacts, and photos that explore the national fight for the 19th Amendment's ratification. During our panel discussion today, if you have questions, you can go down to the bottom and enter a question. Make sure that you uh, select question to all panelists so that um, we'll be able to see it. When we, when we began discussing how we could kick off um, our exhibits on women's suffrage during this very challenging time of a pandemic, we were connected with a trio of professors, Dr. Alice Catherine Carls, Dr. Renee Lafleur, and Dr. Manoa Uffelman, who had all worked on the same project on women's activism in the progressive area. It's a really great book um, that I recommend you uh, getting, and we thought it would be really fascinating to hear from them a little bit about rural America and, and Tennessee and Tennessee's role. Um, before we dive in, I want to ask each one of our esteemed um, guests to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit about their research on um, early women's activ activism. Dr. Carls, why don't you kick us off? Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us this morning. I am a proud member of the history faculty at the University of Tennessee at Martin. And uh, I got involved in World War I research through my appointment on the Tennessee Great War Commission. And so I have been doing this since 2014. And I naturally branched into women's history because during the war, uh, Jackson had a very active chapter of the American Red Cross. And that's how I got involved. And then it branched out from there. Fantastic. Uh, Dr. Offelman, how about you? Well, I'm a professor of history at Austin Peay State University. Uh, I've been teaching there quite a few years. Um, I've edited, edited a couple of um, Civil War diaries. Um, in the first volume about our progressive women, I wrote about uh, canning clubs, which is activism and agricultural reform. And canning clubs became 4-H. So everybody knows about 4-H. And in this volume, I've written about the United Daughters of the Confederacy. And I teach women's history and Southern history. Fantastic. Dr. LaFleur? Hi. Um, I am a history professor at the University of Tennessee at Martin. I'm also the director of our Center for Women and Gender Equality. My research interests have always been about um, how people create change. Social movements have always fascinated me. How do you get from sitting around a table complaining about something to doing something about it? And my research had always been sort of in the 1960s, and I was tired of that and was looking for something else to do when Manoa pushed me into writing a chapter for this book on the Progressive Era, which is my second favorite era in American history. And so I, I looked at uh, women's clubs in Martin, Tennessee and Jackson, Tennessee, uh, groups that nobody has ever written about or any really paid any attention to. Um, and it's been a really fun uh, experience being able to write about these women's groups. Fantastic. And, and I, we're going to hear more about each one of uh, the, the work that all of you do. Um, for those of you watching, grab a cup of coffee. We're very laid back and casual. Um, we're going to have fun talking about this uh, really um, important topic and feel free to ask questions. We'll save a little bit of time towards the end to answer any questions. Uh, first of all, Dr. LaFleur, um, I'm not sure that you dress this way every day, but um, why don't you tell us a little bit if that is a costume about how you're dressed? Yes, it is a costume. Let me, I'll, I'll stand up briefly so that uh, people can get sort of the full effect. So I'm wearing white today. I've got a long skirt on and a, and a white shirt and I've got the sash on. And I am dressed as um, a suffragist. 
Uh, the suffragists uh, use different types of symbols and um, to highlight their movement and to explain their purpose. Many of them wore white and they wore white as a sign of purity. One of the criticisms that women who fought for the right to vote regularly got is that they were unwomanly, they were unfeminine, they were um, you know, maybe sinful. So wearing white was a way of showing their, their purity. It also was a way to set them apart. If you see a huge crowd of women wearing white, you're like, oh, what are they up to? Uh, so wearing white helped them stand out. I also am wearing a sash that says votes for women on it. And the votes for women is in purple. The colors of the women's suffrage movement in the United States were, were gold, white, and purple. White was for purity, uh, purple was, was for, for, for loyalty. They said that they are patriotic, they're not anti-American, right, they're loyal. And then the other color was gold and, or yellow. And I have a yellow rose here on my, on my chest here uh, to symbolize that gold part. The, the gold was, was hope. It represented hope. And it comes from a referendum in Kansas that Cherry, Carrie Chapman Catt uh, was trying to get women's suffrage passed in Kansas. Kansas' state flower is the sunflower, and so yellow was, was sort of the theme. And so they picked up yellow. The yellow rose also becomes very important in the fight in Tennessee. Uh, sometimes it was referred to as the battle of the roses. Uh, those who were pro-suffrage wore the yellow roses. Uh, the anti-suffrage people wore red roses. I also have, and I'm not wearing it because I wanted you to be able to see it, this um, pen, and it's of a jailhouse door. Alice Paul had pins like this made as part of the National Women's Party uh, to, to commemorate women who were arrested for demonstrating for women's suffrage, which I have a picture of them doing that behind me. Um, they were arrested and they claimed the status of political prisoners and went on hunger strikes. They were forced fed in the process, which is a very, very uncomfortable experience for the women who endured it. And so they had these pins to commemorate their experience and as an act of solidarity. This is what I'm willing to do to fight for the right to vote. So no, Scott, I do not wear this every day. <laughs> and in fact, I'm going to take the hat off. I'm not Yes, but Dr. Carls. Generally annoying. Right, right, right on this and the exhibit that you have, the background that you uh -huh. have behind you, Renee. Um, Sue Shelton White, who was extremely instrumental in the passing, the in ratifying the amendment, the 19th Amendment in Tennessee, was a devoted suffragist from Henderson, Tennessee, and she practiced in Jackson, Tennessee. She was very, very prominent. And in 1919, she went to Washington, D.C. She picketed the White House. She brought President Wilson in effigy, and that earned her five days in jail. And when she came back to Jackson, the first women's rally that she had, she proudly displayed the pin that uh, Dr. Lafleur just showed us. So I thought that was an interesting. Uh, yeah, thank you. That's a, that's, a, that's a great Tennessee connection. Um, yeah. Before we dive more further into Tennessee and the 19th Amendment, Dr. Uffelman, can you kind of explain the progressive era and, and what that meant for, for women during that time? The progressive era was really a time of reform. It was not a unified uh, program of reform. There were lots of people working for different groups, different organizations over for different goals, and it went on for decades. Uh, the Progressive Era is sometimes dated from the 1870s, 1880s to the 1920s. Sometimes even it goes up into the 1930s. Um, but people were working for, uh, there'd been all sorts of changes in American society, urbanization, industrialization, immigration, and people uh, responded to these problems by trying to fix them. So they were working for, um, housing improvement, uh, prevent child labor, working conditions, conservation, pure food and drugs, um, just any number of things. Suffrage is part of it, but also anti-lynching, uh, um, uh, suffrage for African-Americans, uh, civil rights. So uh, there's any number of activities that happened. And it, it, it is a woman's activity. There are, they uh, had settlement houses. Um, so women uh, were at the forefront of the progressive era. Uh, quite often it was middle class and upper class white women because they had the means and they had the time to pursue these goals. 
but there were also working class women. They were particularly active in uh, the trade unions and there were uh, black activists and they worked for anti-lynching, civil rights, suffrage, um, race, anything to do with race to improve relations. So it was a very dynamic time in American history. You also get prohibition trying to do away with alcohol because they thought if they did away with alcohol, it would eliminate all the problems associated with alcohol. So there was all sorts of things happening at, at the, during these decades. Dr. Carls, I know Dr. Uffelman mentioned um, black women. Uh, can you elaborate a little bit on what uh, life would have been like um, as it uh, relates to activism during that time? Uh, I have one uh, name, one uh, uh, name to mention, and that is that of Lane College, founded in 1882, and immediately it became a, um, a center of activism uh, at all the levels that Dr. Offerman was mentioning. Absolutely, uh, uh, two particularly were very important. One was the Canning uh, Station of the Future 4H. And Lane College was a leader before the war and, of course, during the war in um, uh, educating uh, African-American farmers throughout West Tennessee. And there's a very strong connection between Jackson and, um, and Somerville, Pike County. And uh, so we must mention uh, two names, one of May E. Lane, who was the wife of, the, of Dr. James Franklin Lane, who was the son of the founder of Lane College, Dr. Lane. Bishop Lane, and uh, she was extremely active with her husband. They organized all kinds of rallies, fairs, demonstrations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and then the name of Mrs. Beulah Bray, who came as the president's wife of Lane College in 1903, and who was the founder of the Tennessee Federation of Colored Women's Clubs, and that was very, very important. Now I must confess that I have not done the research. A detailed research on this because I had to be selective in my writing about uh, every aspect for Black women, wh white women, clubs, etc. I have not dealt as deeply into that research, but there is a, a treasure trove in information about the work of Beulah Bray and the inspiration that she was behind all this, this progressive agenda that we, we are talking about. And also uh, Lane College and the African-American churches, uh, very, very important in supporting the civil rights and the progressive agenda and the civil rights merged together beautifully. Unfortunately, for those of you who are not familiar with West Tennessee, Mother Liberty Church, uh, CME Church was the founding church, it, it, it and Lane College were the two poles that organized African-Americans in West Tennessee. And a few years ago, all the archives of uh, Mother Liberty Church blew away in a fateful tornado. So everything has been lost. So, but it's these were the two. That's unfortunate, but it's really uh, important that uh, folks like you all and the students that you teach take up the mantle and do research yeah. as much as possible and gather information and publish. And um, so speaking of publishing and all the work that you all do, I'm going to go around now and just ask you a few questions about your own special areas of expertise that you've uh, focused on. Dr. LaFleur, I'm going to start with you. I know that you've done a lot of uh, work in the role of uh, women in clubs, especially in West Tennessee. Can you elaborate a little bit about the role that clubs played in the eventual passing of the amendment? Well, it, it's interesting that the clubs play different roles in, in different places. And in the larger cities like Memphis, uh, they were a little bit more involved in women's suffrage. But I found in Martin in particular, that the women's clubs weren't particularly interested in suffrage. At least the historic record doesn't show it. Instead, what women's clubs did is it allowed women a space in between the domestic sphere, their home, where they you know, are supposed to be, and the public sphere, where they're not really supposed to be at this time. And so the women's clubs allowed them this opportunity to, to have a space that belonged to them. They were the leaders of the groups. They determined the agendas. They ran the budgets. And so they developed all these organizing skills. They developed friendships with the people that they were in these clubs with. Um, and so it's this middle space. But it also provided this opportunity for women that they weren't getting elsewhere. You know, educational opportunities for women uh, at the turn of the century and career opportunities for women are really limited. 
So if you imagine yourself as a 20 year old woman who graduates from seminary or some post-secondary degree, and then you're just like, well, what do I do with this now? You know, I don't, I don't have anything to do with it. I, there's no jobs available for me. I can get married and, and have a house and kids, which can be fulfilling in its own way, but it's not intellectually fulfilling. And so a lot of these clubs were developed as a way to give women that opportunity. The, the Philharmonic Club in Martin, for example, was designed specifically because after women graduated from school, they no longer gave recitals. They no longer had a reason to continue to, to perform. And so the music teacher at the local school developed the club as a way for women to, to continue to practice music. The Mutual Improvement uh, Association in, in Jackson, it was similar as a group of young women sitting around talking about how bored they were after they graduated. And one of the young women's brothers says, well, why don't you start a book club or something? And they took that idea and they ran with it and they made a club that was all about mutual improvement so that they could be continue to be educated. And they studied uh, literature from all around the world, art from all around the world, and they did the research themselves. They wrote the summaries and they gave the presentations themselves. And so these women's clubs were a way for them to be active in a society that really didn't want them to always be active. I wanna mention something about the, the women who occupied these groups. The ones I looked at tended to be middle-class white women. Um, Middle-class white women, as, as Dr. Olfelman noted, had time and means to belong to organizations like this. But also, like Dr. Carl said, there might be groups of African-American women in Martin that, that did these things, but finding the historical record to be able to write about them was challenging. Finding the, the record even for the women's groups was difficult. Um, by chance, I found out that in the back corner of the third floor of the public library contained boxes of materials for the group I was looking at. Nobody has ever even opened the boxes before. So there's a possibility that in some church basement, there is um, some record of an African-American women's group. Um, I just haven't been able to find it yet. So right now, the things I've been writing about have really been focused on white women because that's what the historical record is allowing me to do at this point. So if somebody out there um, knows yeah. where that basement is, yeah. they should let you know, yeah. right? Yes, no, yes they should do. Or write it yourself. It. Yes, write, write it yourself. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, take up the man, pick up the mantle and do it. Yeah, absolutely. It can be in your grandmother's attic. It can be an old box. Don't don't throw anything away. Yeah, that's that's absolutely yeah. the truth. Um, Dr. Uffman, your, um, some of your writing has been about a topic that is certainly in the news uh, these days. Um, and I'm personally fascinated by uh, the uh, story of the United Daughters of the Confederacy and uh, the work that they did and how we're still discussing a lot of that today. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, I can. The United Daughters of the Confederacy uh, is in the news a lot today because they erected hundreds of uh, monuments to Confederates over the decades. Um, they were established in 1894 in Nashville, and Tennesseans have always been at the forefront of the UDC. Um, there were chapters in about half of the um, counties in Tennessee. And of course, East Tennessee had a lot of unionist counties, so only Confederate descendants could join. So therefore, those people couldn't join because they were of unionist descent. Uh, cities often had many chapters. Uh, I, I just checked, uh, Martin had one, Milan had, Milan had two, Union City had two. Um, so they are the most, um, they are most famous at, uh, for the monuments, but during their time, they also ran nursing homes. They were extremely educated and uh, interested in education. Now, what they wanted to educate children to was the lost cause and pro-Confederate side of history. So they often, wrote, if they, they wrote some books, they um, donated books, they gave thousands and thousands, thousands of scholarships over the years. So they were extremely active. So um, historian Karen Cox has called it the Confederate progressivism. It was progressivism, but it was only for Confederates. 
Um, yeah, I, I read where you wrote that Rassie White, who is from our area of Paris, Tennessee, uh, she was president and she wrote that their goal was to ensure that uh, the United Daughters of the Confederacy would maintain traditional concepts of what a Southern lady embodied. I'm curious, what, what was that? Yeah, this speaks to the um, class element of it. Uh, the daughters wanted to uh, maintain the racial hierarchy. They were interested in manners and behaviors. And so uh, they should be ladylike at all times. Now, while they are ladylike, they are doing all sorts of political activities. Um, it's interesting, they were not, the UDC had no stance on suffrage. Um, they are agnostic on suffrage. So some of the members were probably forced suffrage and others were anti, but the organization itself did not have a stance. And you know, they all would have had an opinion about it because <laughs> they were on at, this, at the same time. So she was, um, White was a very uh, prominent uh, member at the time. She was the national president. She, um, was upset that uh, there, at the Battle of Shiloh had Union um, states building monuments and there was none for the Confederacy. So she set about getting that built and she was put in charge in 1905. She raised $50,000 and they built the monument which was dedicated in 1917. When she was president, there was another conference in Washington, D.C. She managed to arrange for um, the UDC to uh, have a reception at the White House. So she was uh, very important and influential. Um, it is the, there, there is still a United Daughters of the Confederacy. Are they sort of separating themselves more from that previous message or what's the situation there? Well, um, I really don't know a lot about what's going on today. I've gone, I went to their website to check. I do know that they've issued statements denouncing racial violence and they've denounced hate groups. Um, they're still active in Tennessee. Uh, I tried to find out some numbers, but I couldn't. So yeah, there are chapters. There's probably chapters still active in West Tennessee right now. Excellent, thank you. Um, Dr. Carls, I'm curious, um, You've done a lot of work with rural. How, how do you feel like uh, the activism was different for those who lived in rural communities versus those who lived like in Memphis or Nashville uh, in the city? Well, that's a very good question. I think there, the emphasis of, on, of women's work in rural West Tennessee was threefold. As uh, Dr. Lafleur has uh, shown, the main one was cultural and it's something that I didn't delve on when I was looking at their yearbooks, but they had all the great books and all the places in the world on their program. And I thought, okay, this is interesting, but that's not what I'm looking for. So I looked for the other two aspects that they were involved in. And one was uh, philanthropy. They were very, very big on two things, on helping children, giving scholarship, scholarships to children and helping them go to school, uh, paying their medical bills, that type of thing. And then the work for the blind, which very incredibly um, goes, precedes the war and then goes all the way up to the war. So there were those three aspects there. And so women were very, very uh, uh, involved in those three. Now, the part of the progressive era that I'm most familiar with uh, is the wartime era, 1917 to 1919. And it's very interesting to see that from 1914 on, all those women's clubs are gearing towards the war. They're increasing their efforts in food and philanthropy. The University of Tennessee should be extremely proud of the leading role that they played in starting the county agents and um, uh, starting what eventually became the 4-H. And then, of course, the, the Red Cross began to, you know, kind of uh, 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 happen. And so what we see is a trend towards the consolidation of those women's local women's clubs and, and under umbrellas. And I want to briefly give a picture of those umbrellas because the big ones were the Tennessee Federation of Colored Women's Clubs and then the Tennessee Federation of Women, uh, which kind of gathered all of the women's clubs under the Tennessee, the state level. And then I want to talk a little bit about the national level because 
the uh, Women's uh, Committee on the Council of National Defense is a great untold story. And they were trying to harness all of this incredible amount of energy that was coming from women. They were overwhelmed. And so uh, who do they name as president of this uh, Women's Committee? Um, it is, um, <laughs> I have it here, Dr. Anne Howard Shaw, who was a 70 year old woman who was a suffragist. Uh, Dr. Lafleur, I'm sure that you have encountered her name. And she was there. And then the, this uh, women's committee got bogged down into the bureaucracy and they couldn't do much of anything. But to me, it's very fascinating that they established a, a, a state council. So it went all the way to the top and then they established state councils and they worked with. Uh, the Food Administration for the Pure Food and Drug Act. They were pushing very, very hard for that because there were so many Tennesseans who were malnourished that the when the men enrolled, they had to refuse a proportion of men who were too undernourished to serve. And so the women got to work during the war really on doing that. <clears throat> and so the war effort really brought this uh, public visibility of women to a new level with public health, and public food safety. Uh, they brought them on the public sphere. Uh, and that is visible absolutely everywhere. And all the little, the, the local clubs that I looked at in, you know, uh, be it Red Cross 4 H and all the other mutual improvement, uh, 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 the Jewish hives, they were Jewish hives active through West Tennessee, uh, the African American efforts through Lane College, all of that was really uh, greatly helped by the wars organization effort. And something else that I want to add before I, I, I finish is this. <clears throat> we are focusing on the suffrage, but the suffrage is not everything. I want our listeners to remember. Um, it was preceded by women's work in so many areas, like food and health and uh, education and children and helping handicap the blind. This is all that women do all of that. They, they do a multiplicity of tasks together simultaneously. So that's what was important. And then the suffrage and the civil rights movement grafted themselves onto that. And then out of the, the war comes an incredible um, opportunity for women to be nominated to positions. And so I want to say that the suffrage is one part of women's rights. The uh, uh, positions nominated or elected office are another very important fight that started after uh, World War One, And so it, it's, it's really incredible to see this. Unfortunately, in 1929, we see the women's clubs and their efforts kind of the, the progressive era is brought to an end. All of that is brought to an end. And I want to put a plug for the future that we are facing today with this pandemic, because if you have read uh, the news, there is a great deal of concern that women are going to lose the rights that they have won in, in terms of not just the vote, but their ability to hold office, their simply their financial and time ability, like Dr. Foman said, to be working on women's causes in the same way, because we have an economic depression now, in the same way in which women were set back in 1929. But the war, the war to me is the, the crucible in which the women's efforts were brought to another level. And it's very, very visible in, in West Tennessee. I can add uh, a little bit. Uh, the, the, uh, Catherine's completely right. World War I opens this door for women to be involved, this volunteer patriotism. And we see that in the clubs that I studied in Martin and, and the membership in the clubs is also the membership of the leaders of the local Red Cross. They, they cross over. And I know it's because of their experiences in, in the clubs that gives them the ability to run the Red Cross. Um, but the Red Cross in, in Martin, I thought did something, at least it was humorous to me. They shamed the women's clubs for not doing enough. Um, uh, in the Martin Mail, I'm going to read just quickly. It says, uh, we don't like to think the women of Martin are slackers, but our work rooms very often look as if some were not doing their duty. Um, so nobody wants to be called a slacker. And then later, they, they hold up one club over others. If all the clubs, societies, and other organizations of Martin believed in doing their bit like the sewing square, our little city would merit a reputation for patriotism of which we might feel proud. 
they use they use women's clubs as a way to sort of compete with each other to outdo each other to support the the movement of the Red Cross and and the funding for the Liberty Bonds. Um, but it's really interesting to see how women turned all of their attentions away from what their clubs were doing. They suspended most of their activities and just focused it solely on the war effort and what they could do. And to get to what Catherine was saying is that you suffered is just this, it's an important piece of the puzzle, but it's only part of it. Women's patriotism and civic engagement and the way they influence policy was happening long before women's suffrage and of course long after. Um, food riots during the Civil War, for example, in Confederate cities because they didn't have enough food, I mean, it forced the Confederate government to take action. Petitions, fundraisers, the, the boycotts of the American Revolution, right? Boycotting tea, um, homemade cloth, never would have been successful without the support of women, right? So women's political activism and our ability to influence politics suffrage is part of that, but it's not the whole thing. So you all have done uh, a spectacular job of laying the, setting the scene, if you will, for what was going to happen right here in Tennessee. Before we jump to Tennessee, I feel like I should acknowledge Paula Casey and her work to make sure that people remember this. Paula was the publisher of The Perfect 36, Tennessee Delivers Women's Suffrage. And I highly recommend everybody, if you're interested in this topic at all, get that book and read it. It's fascinating and well done. And uh, Paula has just been um, a huge champion of uh, us remembering women's suffrage um, and somebody who's just a fascinating uh, person to get to talk to. Anyway, we had her on our Discovery Park of America podcast a couple episodes ago. So if you're interested, go back and listen to that as well. So it was the um, summer of 1920, 35 of the 36 states necessary had ratified the amendment eight states had rejected the amendment, and five um, had not yet voted. Uh, suffragists saw Tennessee as the last best hope for ratification before the 1920 presidential election. Dr. Uffelman, do you want to sort of continue to set the stage for us on what was going on in Nashville? I guess it would be around 100 years ago today. Well, I'll set the stage. There was a lot of stuff happening. Um, both sides realized it was now or never. So both sides pulled out all the stops. Um, they took up the pro-suffrage uh, people. Uh, Carrie Catt took up residence at the Hermitage. The anti-suffrage people took up residence at the Hermitage. Um, it was uh, fraught with everything. There was probably bribery going on. Uh, it was in prohibition, but somehow there was a Jack Daniel suite so they could get uh, politicians to come up and they could pressure them not to um, vote for suffrage. The liquor industry did not want women to vote. Um, the people who owned factories and the railroads, they did not want women to vote. Uh, the, they were afraid women would outlaw child labor and improve labor conditions. Uh, the railroads were often corrupt and they didn't want these meddlesome women voting and cleaning up uh, their business. So there were incredibly powerful lobbying groups against women's suffrage. And then you get so you get the racist atti attitude that uh, well, if we let women vote, then we're going to have to maybe let black men vote again. And that um, upset a lot of white Southerners. So it was just fraught with a lot of turmoil and um, corruption and arguments, and it was just intense. Um, Dr. Carls, in your research, uh, can you pick up on what was the, you know, split between women who were living in rural Tennessee? Were, the, were most of them for, su for suffrage, against, you know, did they not care? What, what, do you, what, what have you seen and what you've read? Um, well, I have seen a lot of cautious attitudes because women were divided, obviously. Uh, for, for most of them, I would say suffrage was maybe a little bit less important uh, than uh, in, um, uh, in cities. I want to quote very briefly from Mrs. J.C. Felsenthal, who was the head of the 
uh, diamond hives in Humboldt. It was a Jewish group, and the Jewish groups were very, very important. In 1916, she made a speech about the spirit of democracy. And she said it's all pervading. It's very, very interesting how she uh, shows that she gives examples of historical women who are very strong on women's rights. She doesn't name suffrage per se. And then she treads very carefully. Uh, again, it's the time, you know, the time is there and also the rural area. And again, she was between uh, Memphis, uh, Jackson, Humboldt, Brownsville. She was in this very, very west, uh, Western part of West Tennessee. And she called the work of women in for democracy, a spiritualizing force, an interesting choice of word, <clears throat> and bringing a spirit of gentle helpfulness. And so I find that interesting because it's very cautious language and we find the same caution uh, repeated in many places. Um, <clears throat> it's not the UDC, but it's the Daughters of the American Revolution. I think they were split too, but I think they took a, a positive stand on suffrage at some point. Um, Sue Shelton White was campaigning from Knoxville. She was enlisting rural women, 50,000 African-American women to work for this agenda of suffrage, but first of all, patriotism. So you see, it's not suffrage. We cannot distinguish or separate suffrage from the civic service, from a different type of service. And women were just putting all of that together. Uh, probably it's the right attitude because you cannot just separate the vote. It's not that. You have the vote, you have the conditions to vote. And as I mentioned, there are all kinds of, uh, of other issues there. But there, there were, there were uh, pockets. Union City, for example, had a very active group of African-American women who were for civil rights. And of course, they were for the vote. Uh, so it, it was different. Trenton was not very active at the time, I don't think during the war, and they were, uh, they were really kind of uh, quiet. They were very quiet. So you cannot find a lot of statements. You, you can find a lot of statements about, yes, we're for the vote, because the pressures were too great, so you had to go about it kind of in an oblique way, like Mrs. Kelsenthal did, and I think that's kind of... Uh, interesting and but, they didn't they didn't have they didn't have facebook <laughs> no we have facebook and i can say to all the young women out there african-american women white women native american women go research your past write your history write your history it is remarkable, remarkable all the tools that we have today to to do research yeah. Oh, um, yeah. you all have spent you know a career someone like me who's just interested can also search my own ancestry and thanks to all the tools that are available we we all can be amateur uh historians and hopefully don't screw up the work that all of all of you do so well um Really quickly, I'm curious, uh, Dr. LaFleur, I know that Tennessee's governor, Governor Roberts, was a nervous politician who was getting ready to face re-election. Um, where was his head during all this? And I know Woodrow Wilson was the president. What, you know, what was his stance? Woodrow Wilson's stance or the governor? Um, both. Both? Well, Wilson was reluctant, right? Wilson was... Um, just to be completely blunt, a super racist, anti-Semitic, sexist guy. Um, he was <laughs> he was reluctant to support anybody who was different than him, right? He showed Birth of a Nation in the White House and said, yeah, this is a great film, right? Um, so he was reluctant. A lot of men, right, are reluctant to give power to women. Um, uh, and, and talking about what the men's positions are is somewhat important, but I really like focusing on the women. I mean, to be honest with you, the, the, and especially being a woman, the idea that you have to beg somebody for rights is really humiliating, right? And I, and I experienced that as a woman. I know other, um, you know, black women, indigenous women, women of color all have this experience. And so like talking about us and what we had to do in order to get the rights it's just so important. And so if this guy is nervous, well, go ahead, be nervous. Um, we're the ones that are in the tough spot, right? We're the ones that are hard. And I, I feel the same thing about uh, Harry Burns, right? Who, who had this, the swing vote, which I think probably you're Scott, you were gonna get to here in a moment anyway. 
he was the one, it was tied in the House uh, of Representatives in this, the Tennessee State Legislature, and he changed his vote. And so one version of the story is women have the 19th Amendment because of Harry Burns. Well, that's not true. They have the right to vote because of Harry Burns's mother. And his mother is the one who encouraged him, raised him in such a way that he listened to his mother, right? This is something we hear a lot today, listen to women, right? Listen to black women. Well, Harry Burns did that. He listened to his mom. Uh, and he changed his vote. And then went and hid, from what I understand, after he changed his vote, he went and hid in the bell tower of the Capitol building um, <laughs> so that people wouldn't, wouldn't bother him. Um, but you know, the, the activism of women and all the effort that white women and black women had to put to put pressure to get these nervous men to change their mind is where the real story is. Um, it's, it's an important question. Scott, I'm not trying to say that. But it's not one that that interests me quite well, so much. One thing I am very fascinated about, and I have just a very basic knowledge of what I've read and what I've heard from you all. Um, did all that actually happen in the way that it has been reported through history, or was there some kind of a setup? You know, like it's a it's an awfully good story to tell your your mother you know, said that. And in the speech he made afterwards where he, you know, acknowledged, you know, a uh, mother's boy or whatever he's, you know, that, is that all like hardcore fact or was there any kind of pre-gaming going on? It, it was not pre-gaming. It was, it, it was, it was a fact. He personally supported suffrage, um, but his constituents didn't. Um, he, he gave interviews afterwards. He really did get the letter, he really did, his mother was a suffragist. And uh, he, according to his, an interview he did later in life, he said, uh, I knew this is my vote that would be remembered forever. And he, he, he did the right thing. And he was right. We talked about him today. Yes. Um, so immediately following the vote, you know, I mean, this is like a tense moment um, nationally, uh, locally, uh, based on what you all have researched, anybody can answer this. What, what was the feeling of the city? Of course, they didn't have social media and they couldn't immediately watch uh, the news, but I'm sure the, the newspapers the next day were all over the United States were probably reporting on what happened in, in Nashville. What was it like in the city, do you suppose, based on what you've read? I think there was a lot of turmoil. There was a lot of political maneuvering because the antis didn't give up. They kept trying to do all these um, maneuvers to um, reverse the amendment. So it was really tense for a while before it was finally settled. And then, um, so yeah, there was a lot of negative um, attitude about the, the vote. And then, um, it took a long time to educate women to vote. So the League of Women Voters had to educate or try, that was their mission to educate women to become uh, citizens and exercise their franchise. Before we yes. move on to talk about the present and the future, does anybody have anything they wanna add that they think is important that we all know about uh, suffrage? Uh, I, have, I have two points. One, the anti-suffrage group, it's, it's sometimes hard for people to understand that women were part of that group, that it's not just men and it's not just um, the different industry lobbies, but women were active in the group. And professional women, the head of, the president of the Tennessee Association Opposed to Women's Suffrage uh, was Josephine A. Pearson. And she was a professional woman. She was a principal. She was widely published, um, but she opposed, opposed women's suffrage. Um, and, and so I think, you know, that's something that's important for us to talk about, especially in the modern context, when we try to understand why women make the decisions that they do. There is, there's no such thing as a women's voting block, for example. That was one thing that surprised people after women got the right to vote. It didn't significantly change voting. You know, all of the doom and gloom scenarios that they put forward didn't happen. And those who were worried that giving white women the vote was gonna give black women the vote, well, the disenfranchisement laws in, in states applied to black women too. And so they, they were still disenfranchised. 
Um, so there wasn't there wasn't really really that change. Um, so I just wanted to mention a little bit about who those anti-suffragists were, and then also um, that even though the suffrage amendment, the 19th Amendment passed, there's still a huge portion of the U.S. female population, African Americans, who are are still disenfranchised, which means they don't have the right to vote. Um, we're gonna. Uh... Uh, ask the questions really quickly that are coming in from the uh, folks watching us. If anybody has a question, you can hit the chat button um, and post it. First of all, Betty Ann Tanner, um, who's been very active in um, our region, uh, she posted that um, the Hermitage Hotel in Nashville was recently listed as a Department of Interior's National Historic Landmark. So that's a, a really uh, interesting acknowledgement um, of that location in history that we're all interested in. Um, Mary Nita Bondurant has asked, as a female, I'm curious about how you think we are doing in our fight for equality. There are still differences in pay and opportunities for women. And what are your thoughts on Biden nominating the first female candidate for vice president of the United States? Anybody? Well, first of all, it's, it's not the first female candidate. This would be the, the third. It's the first African-American woman. And I, I tell you, it's really exciting to be able to talk about women's suffrage and women's rights on the eve of that announcement. Because no matter what political party you belong to, it's it's an exciting move. I think Sarah Palin even came out and said, stand on the shoulders of Geraldine Ferraro and myself and learn from us, right? There's this solidarity, a hope amongst women that, that we like to see other women, um, other women achieve. Um, but there's some really fascinating things going on with, um, with women's issues today. And um, I was in a discussion yesterday on women's suffrage and somebody asked me, what can we learn from the women's suffrage movement? And I, and I said, well, we can learn about organizing and things like that. But I think the best thing that we learn from the women's suffrage movement is what not to do. The exclusionary tactics of the white suffragists um, really weaken the movement. It would have been stronger. And today we are stronger when we work together. And this is something that, that comes up again and again. The women's movement in the 1970s was criticized at first for not, again, not including black women and not including uh, lesbians either. And today we see it over and over again. The Me Too movement, uh, Alyssa Milano was the one that amplified it, but it took a while for people to realize it was an African-American woman, Tarana Burke, who really started it, right? So these are still conversations we need to have. Um, in the realm of women's studies, we talk about intersectionality which is the intersection of being a woman and other things, the intersection of woman and race and class and religion, uh, sexuality, all of those things influence who we are as women and uh, we're stronger together. Uh, being more inclusive is, is better for everybody. So I think one of the things we can learn from suffragists moving forward is, is to not to be so exclusive. Dr. Elfelman, how about you? I think one of the things to learn from the, the movement is that it took concerted effort through multi-generations, um, lots and lots of hard work. And just because something is gained doesn't mean it's going to last. And I think we're at a point where um, women and minorities uh, and just democracy is being threatened and we must be vigilant and fight for it. Dr. Carls? Well, I would like to put the spotlight on Sue Shelton White because she embodied so many aspects of the, the suffrage movement and the rights for women. She not only campaigned for the suffrage, but she uh, uh, was instrumental in passing the first Married Women's Rights Act in Tennessee. And then she, was, uh, she worked with Eleanor Roosevelt on the Social Security Administration Act. Uh, she campaigned. Uh, she nearly ran for U.S. Senate in 1925. Uh, she also worked for Senator McKellar. Uh, she was the first lawyer in Jackson, Tennessee. She did a lot of firsts in a lot of different areas. And so I would like to uh, encourage uh, young women to look at her, uh, the diversity of what she did. And we women can do those multiplicity of things and do them well because they are all related. Uh, one thing that I want to say about her is that 1917, when she was on the Tennessee Federation of Women's Clubs, uh, and it's something that is not very well known, but it fits into what we've been saying. 
uh, number one, of course, she advocated the vote for black and white women. She worked with black and white women in recruiting them for the war effort. And she was extremely instrumental in uh, the food, uh, uh, the Pure Food Act. And she worked a lot on those other uh, activities that the, the clubs of Tennessee were doing. So that is very, very important. And I would like to uh, cite her a famous uh, last three admonitions to people. Remember the past, hold fast to the present and build for the future. So that's we, seem to, we seem to have lost Scott yeah. and uh, Discovery Park, but this is showing we're still live on, on, on Facebook. So um, I opened up the chat and I see a question here that I, maybe we could address. What international connections did suffragists have? I know uh, Carrie Chapman Cat was involved in the international movements for suffrage and she went to Japan and China um, to help uh, suffrage movements there. Catherine, are you familiar uh, with what was happening in the, the main continent of Europe? I know England yeah. and the United States obviously had close ties. Uh, they were in the lead, but there was a very strong women's activism movement and it was tied to pacifism. And as the as World War I grew, grew closer, of course, you know, the women were, were very, very active, but they were prevented from meeting during the war because they had not only a suffragist, but a pacifist agenda. Uh, I want to throw this in and uh, that's, uh, the, the Russian women were pretty much working I mean, they, they were part of this international movement of women before the war, but it's when women descended in the streets of Petrograd that the Russian Revolution began in February 1917. And that's something when I tell that to my students, they, they are always surprised. They think it was the men striking in the factories who started it, but actually the women took it in the streets and made it public. And so women's activism uh, can work at many, many levels. If I may uh, put in another uh, uh, anecdote that comes from European women and especially the rights of women in France to vote. Uh, you hear it from my accent, I was born in France and raised in France where women did not have the vote until 1948. And the reason is because the socialists did not want women to vote. It was not the conservatives like here who did not want the women to vote, it was the socialists because they said, women are all going to vote conservatively. So we do not want to give them the vote. And I think that's uh, an interesting comparison. If somebody uh, out there this question, Zoe, if you're interested in researching these uh, international connections further, that's, that's a very, very good topic. And there's a lot of literature about it. Well, this would be a good time to make the connection between Alice Paul going to England and learning the radical techniques from the suffragettes right. the, uh, and then bringing those radical techniques back to strategies to the United States. So the picketing and um, being arrested and then the hunger strikes, um, all of that, she was influenced by the British suffragettes. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. well, we have an we have another question where the statements, I think this is in reference to, to what you were saying, Catherine, about women not talking publicly about their support of suffrage. Were the yeah. statements not made because groups didn't want to issue public statements or because publishers wouldn't print them? I do not know that. And I think it would be a very difficult thing to answer because in order to do that, you would have to have access to a woman's diary from the time period. Um, I would. I also came across a very interesting woman, uh, Anne Hyde Clark, who was the editor of the Nashville Banner after her husband, which she took over after her husband passed away, and uh, her life might shed some light about that because she was a publisher, and um, but again in a very uh, uh, important urban area, not in the rural areas. But I think in the rural areas, people were rather loath to have public statements. The only statement I've heard about the um, uh, Daughters of the American Revolution uh, about uh, suffrage was from a, a brief one sentence 
in one of their reports and it was almost invisible. So that's, so far that's all I have. But you know, when you do women's history, you have to kind of uh, 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 go obliquely about this and find the sources where you, where you can find them. And it's like putting something together with as best you can. <laughs> You all had this problem doing your research, but women at this time oftentimes went by their husband's mm -hmm. name, Mrs. Yeah. You know, Richard oh, yeah, they all did, yeah. And it was really hard to track down who these people actually were because they were sort of masked by, um, by their husband's names. One woman, though, who started uh, the 20th Century Club in Martin, she always went by her name, Mrs. Virginia Gardner. I think she was a very proud woman, very independent. You got that sense that she never, her husband's name was never mentioned when they talked about her. Uh, everybody else, though, was. It was sort of this tricky thing to do, which leads us, uh, Zach asks, uh, where is the best place to begin researching women's suffrage in Tennessee? <laughs> this is the trouble we've been talking about. It's hard this to locate the things. Yeah. yeah, it's hard to locate things sometimes. I found out about the Mutual Improvement Club in Jackson because I was doing research in Memphis and they have one, one of the uh, meeting books in Memphis. And nobody seems to know why they have it in Memphis. And all the rest of them are in the ones that exist are in Jackson. And then it's like, which ones exist and which ones don't? And how do you find them? It's very yeah. hard. No, I think, that, I think there's a lot of information in local newspapers, but it, it, a lot of the local newspapers are not digitized yet. So in Montgomery yeah. County, a committee uh, wanted to find out about the suffragists in the, in, in the county and the paper wasn't digitized. So a committee went through every page of the uh, Clarksville newspaper and just whoop, one right after another and made a list of all the names they could identify. Well, that took weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, but that information is there for someone to find it. But eventually as local newspapers are digitized and you can do a search, it'll be a lot easier to find those kind of things. If you look at the national newspapers and the big city newspapers, uh, it's a lot easier to find information. And there's really been some good documentaries that came out this year to commemorate the centennial. So check your local PBS station. That sounds corny, but there's been some really good shows to come out. You can learn a lot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, Caroline asks, can DPA make a re recommended reading list from the panelists? I think uh, Dr. Olfman put one together. And we'll make sure Scott posts that somewhere so that, mm -hmm. so that everybody can get it. There's been some really great books out recently. Uh, the Woman's Hour in particular is, is just a, it's a great read. It's a really well-written history book. Let's see. Um, from from Anne, we have, would you mind giving other examples of what women's life lives were like in the time period? Um, mm -hmm you know, that women had limited job opportunities and, and were denied the right to vote. Mm -hmm. If you lived on a farm, it was, it was hard. Um, we're at a time when there's no electricity, there's probably no running water. Um, and I wrote about the canning clubs and uh, we don't think of canning as this new tech, cutting edge technology. But when women could can and have good preserved food, nutritious, that was a big deal. And they were eager to learn that technology. So a lot of the things that we take absolutely for granted, they did not. The fact that you can turn on a faucet and get fresh, clean water was something they couldn't take for granted. If you wanted to cook, you had to cut your wood and bring the wood in and burn it to make the heat to cook. So uh, it's really hard to imagine what life was like in rural America back then. And um, one thing that uh, we need to remember is transportation, because uh, for women to get together, they had to travel from one house to the next, and sometimes from one uh, little village to the next, where there was a meeting of the club they wanted to meet with. Uh, the streets were not paved. 
1914, I think Jackson was the first city in West Tennessee to have all of its city roads paved and five miles out. And they touted that in the national newspapers as a great improvement. And so uh, when the war comes, you have, of course, greater transportation and you still have to do it by, you know, horse and buggy or, you know, the first automobiles are coming very, very slowly, but it is a long process. It's a tedious process and it adds to the difficulty of rural women to uh, gather together. And this is something that I have encountered in my uh, research, not only in West Tennessee, but in rural areas in Bulgaria, for example, or Eastern Europe, where in the interwar years, the women were much slower to organize because they did not have the roads and the means to travel and it took time, which they did not have. So this was an added hardship. So uh, that added to the restrictions that were put on them in terms of associating for doing women's work, but also finding jobs. Uh, I think life was difficult in that, that respect. Transport we tend to forget transportation, that that's a key component. Uh, There's also a lot of legal restrictions on women. Um, for example, married women had no control over what happened with their children. A divorce was very difficult to obtain in some places, even in instances of domestic violence. People didn't want to talk about domestic violence either um, in, in a lot of situations. Um, even after women's suffrage is passed, there's still laws all over the place that limit women's rights. And some states had laws that a woman had to get position permission from her husband to run for office. Um, and that's one of the reasons why there is a movement for the Equal Rights Amendment immediately following the passage of the 19th Amendment so that all of the laws in the United States would not discriminate based on, on, on gender because it's just there were, you know, an unequal pay, for example, was another problem that, that women continued to face before and after uh, women's suffrage. Okay, so this is a little bit longer question. In the earliest years of the United States, few people even questioned the fact that women lacked the right to vote. The Declaration of Independence even claimed that all men were created equal and, and means men in the literal sense, offering no protection of rights to women. Why had this mindset developed in the United States and around the world, especially knowing that most earlier histories were matriarchal? Anyone want to take a crack at that? <laughs> That's the big question, isn't it? I have a I have an anecdote and it's incidental, but it was at the time and the date has not been given to me, but um, uh, at the time that the Native Americans were negotiating treaties, land treaties with the British. So it's the early days of the Republic. Mm -hmm. And so the British come in their uniforms, you know, and they're all men sitting around the table and the Indian chiefs come and then they take a look around and they ask the British, where are your women? And the British say, well, we don't have women on our councils. And the uh, Native Americans say, but we do. And we always associate our women with decision-making. So that shows the great difference in, uh, uh, you know, in uh, perceptions. And of course the, the British were, uh, you know, they were here first before the United States became the United States. And so they were very patriarchal also. I think patriarchy comes with the, with Western civilization more, uh, more than any other civilization. Non-white uh, non civilizations, African civilizations, Native American civilizations, et cetera, are much more, uh, give much more rights to women or gave in the past to answer that question. And again, that's not a perfect answer, but I'm wondering where Scott is. Uh, I thought maybe he came back, but he's not. He, it seems that he here. has disappeared. It's 11.04 and he said he wanted to close this uh, discussion at around an hour's time. So I wonder if we should maybe answer the last question. Uh, today's protests are, uh, tactics oh, are demonized. Oh. Uh, I assume the same thing happened a century ago. What do you think uh, radical uh, tactics imported from England played the role that they played? Oh, they lost internet access in Union City. Oh, wow. That's why we're left on our own. That's why we're carrying on, like women yeah. do, right? <laughs> yes. Oh, that's a, that's a, oh my goodness. <laughs> yeah. 
Uh, yeah. the, the importance of the the radical tactics. Um, hi, Scott. Welcome back. <laughs> hi. I was pretty sure it was Woodrow Wilson up there yanking the internet cord. <laughs> <laughs> you were in the middle of uh, asking one of the questions. Go ahead. Yeah, we carried on. We carried Thank on you. without we, you. <laughs> we were all watching on our phones, like oh, okay. trying to <laughs> mad dash. Oh, goodness. Um, so the radical tactics, was, was what I find interesting about them is that from today's standards, they weren't terribly radical. Um, <laughs> so these women sitting out in front of, of the White House carrying these signs saying, you know, how long should we wait? I mean, you know, I, I know there was a burning of, of Wilson and effigy, but that didn't happen all the time. Um, there were marches, um, even the British movement, the suffragettes, uh, which we didn't get a chance to talk about the difference of those, but the suffragettes blew mm -hmm. stuff up. They blew up mailboxes and a building. You know, they, they were way more radical than what happens in the United States. But I think one of the things this tactic does is, and this is what's so successful in a lot of social movements, is it puts pressure. Um, so that you have to see it. I always tell my students like segregation is not something you see, right? Segregation is the absence of something. So you, you, most people don't notice it. But when you have a group of African-Americans sitting at a lunch counter, all of a sudden segregation is visible. Now you have to respond. The, the absence of women having the right to vote, you know, you can't see that. But having these women stand in front of the White House every day is a constant reminder. This is what's going on. What are you gonna do about it? We're not going away. So, so maybe it didn't have a huge influence on the states, but it certainly made the issue not go away. It kept it on the forefronts of people's minds. It was in the newspapers. People had to pay attention to it. And that's really the difficulty we have with any group that's asking for rights is because it's the absence, right? So how do you get something that you don't have? And how do you explain to people that you don't have it? Right? You need to demonstrate it in some way. And so this was their way their way of doing it and they didn't blow anything up i hope that um everybody has benefited um from this as much as i have it's been such an honor to have the three of you um who are so eloquent and so uh well versed in this area to share with us your knowledge i hope that all three of you come to discovery park and check out our exhibit that we have that opens friday i'm sure you'll uh, uh, enjoy that. And for everybody watching and listening, um, if, if anybody um, has questions, they can absolutely email them to us at Discovery Park of America, and we will get the information and the questions or anything that people want to send to you, we'll um, uh, send to you directly. So they can email info at discoveryparkofamerica.com and we'll get that information to you. And in the meantime, thank you all so much. And let's really get out there and enjoy uh, women's suffrage. <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Thanks, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.